Um, and then I've got a few wires of mine, so all the tools in here are actually my tools at the moment. And so when we take the pot off, we'll be wiring through the pot and cutting them off. Um, I think I might do the same few as I did for the foundation, if I got some cardboard box of, uh, and I cut up with the scissors, so you kind of go a piece of cardboard each that you can be putting your pots on and then maybe wrapping them up later or, or leaving them in here to get to this level hard stage. You've got um, Constellation tomorrow, haven't you? Could you all know, is that come to an end for you? So you We've just be, got lectures. We've got a lecture got a for an hour, that's all. Okay. Yeah. So you could be coming back tomorrow. So if we look at these uh, turning Keen processes lectures. as well. You might even want to come back and have a bit of a, a look at some of those secondary processes. Some moon or your one or two groups. See, that's not very good of me sitting here for you, is it? No, no, that's fine. I'll come around uh, so. so what we've got and what you might want to get for yourself as well if you get it is a little plastic tub. Um, so we've got a few up here around mm -hmm. up on the foundation boat yesterday so we could be using them today. Um, so what uh, one thing that's often useful on rims as well is just a piece of quite soft plastic, the actual just a bit of compression to give a nice even rim. It also builds more strength when you think about the molecular structure of the clay and compressing those flat clay molecules, how important that is. To, to give, both give it strength and... So again, that wire really tight. And sometimes that's not at all uncommon that it would Distort. That's the hard bit, isn't it, as well, getting it off without. That's I'll hard put to... more water under it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That process I was saying about that there's a lot of uh, Chinese and um, yeah, Korean and Japanese potters use is a technique called throwing off the hump. So often they might have a big lump of clay and throw progressively kind of a whole series of bowls off that. But a lot of our students might kind of use similar process as well if they're making lids and smaller pieces. But sometimes even if people are making figurative work or, a, um, for example, making a slab built construct that they want to put little elements on, they might kind of throw, use the, the pot of wheel to throw uh, separate little parts on. But also if, our, if um, ceramic students are uh, looking to test glazes, they want, might want to throw a series of little little bowls to test glazes on. you say that the little uh, you throw in, the harder it is? Well, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting that sense of scale. Tiny pieces, though, all I can say is hard. One of the features I was looking at in that ceramics monthly some years ago with a woman who makes tiny doll's house furniture all in this way off the hump. Tiny, 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 <laughs> tiny things. Um, What's the name? Is it the Japanese artist that makes those little tiny. Uh, Oh, I know who you're talking about. Narasaki. Yeah, it yeah, could be. What, carved ivory? He makes no, um, which one's made of? I've seen a picture of this. Yeah. Narasaki. Oh, that's, yeah, Narasaki. Yeah. Ivory. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but there's probably some that are made out of porcelain too, similar. Yeah, I think, I don't know if you threw them or not. The Japanese are obsessed with miniature. Yeah. 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 For a reason, they've got their reasons for it, yeah. I've done commissions before now, making hundreds of doorknobs for people as well. Little yeah. cupboard knobs in exactly this, we're using this technique mm. as well. Just so you can see how it kind of lends itself to different... Have you gone into post-trauma doorknob? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. It. so it's only getting flashbacks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we've had people who've kind of made um, you know, made little 
uh, knobs like this to kind of stand on slab built containers to give little feet to things. So it's a way of, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice way of working as well to explore a bit while we're doing some making today as well. So um, one of the things when we often start with the first years is we'll look at uh, kind of trying to learn the discipline of making cylindrical forms. Um, often making cylindrical forms does call on a bit more discipline. The natural movement of the wheel and the thinning of the clay makes clay want to open, so making a bowl form is more the natural kind of process that will happen of you working on the wheel, so there's more discipline to be learnt in, in understanding some of the processes by trying to work towards the, the cylinder and combing the clay back in with those cylindrical forms. as you thin the clay, stopping it from kind of wanting to spread out too much. But by all means today, what I want people to do is be a bit explorative, you know, look at the tools that we've got, that I've got of mine here, see how, you know, even pushing, how you can affect the clay by pushing tools in, by manipulating, by kind of pushing the clay to its, its edges really. So I want you to be kind of quite playful with the approaches that you're kind of exploring maybe and documenting what you're doing as you're going along, taking a few videos. I know. I, I, I love watching them. Okay, every time I watch Potter's working, I always think, oh, God, I wish I could do that. Because <laughs> you, you get quite lost in it, don't you? I, I know. I, I think that's the thing for me when I first saw Potter, uh, Potter working. It was just, uh, just I found it so captivating. And like I was saying to you upstairs just now, it's just that sense of just being able to play around with form in such a fluid, fluid way. And it is interesting when you're doing a lot of making as well, how you can kind of just, uh, you can just lose yourself completely in, in the process of making. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're making useful objects. Or even useless objects. Or even useless ones, yeah. <laughs> so one other thing I'll just show you quickly is an enclosed form, which is quite a nice ambition to maybe look at for today as well. I was starting to think as well, some of the pots that come from today, we could even try and keep in a leather hard state and use them for applying slip decoration onto when we have our slip decoration session. We'll have a look later at the uh, class that um, Matt's doing with the Home Truths people because that's the same one you'll, that we'll be working on when we do slip decoration. Um, at what point do you... Um, Uh, slow it down. Really, as soon as it, as soon as it's open, then progressively from then, it said that's yeah. So centered and then opening and then really slow down from that. Just start you make it fast you. Yeah. Bit, yeah. And so faster for that centering process. So I'm going to make just with this piece an enclosed. It's quite a joy having an enclosed form because it's like a bubble then, almost, with the 
because it's got that air trapped inside and you can be quite abusive to the poor clay at this stage. Do you think that's where they got the idea for the uh, architectural domes then? Maybe. <laughs> The Buddhist kind of thing. So with an enclosed form like this, when it's leather hard, we can cut into it at an angle and it can become like a lidded, a lidded jar, but it's quite nice no, once, it's... once it's um, a trapped bubble of air, because it's a lot harder for it to collapse because the air inside is supporting it. So remember how tightly I'm holding that wire when you come to take off yours. So a few kind of ambitions today. If we kind of, I think if we can all get uh, you know, four or five balls of clay at about 500 grams each. And then, um, how are we doing today? Yeah. Was plastic and matte. So, uh, so some of you might want to start moisture's come out, yeah. and we can see, you know, that's really hard to work with now. You know, if you try and bend that, that's going to break really easily. And we used those words when we were talking about um, uh, clay the other day, that idea of plasticity, so the clay that I think you chose to use very much is what the most of an artist of um, Jackson Pollock and applied a lot of those uh, um, notions of abstract expressionism and the energy of kind of throwing a pot um, uh, very much uh, within the, so looking at abstract expressionism in the same way Pollock was with painting, but through the use of form and cutting into it and the energy of making and the cutting of form. So it's interesting the kind of equations and connections you can make to your own oh, right. you subject area. Yeah. So I put down a little pad of clay there and what I might even do is put concentric circles on to help me with placement of the pot. So I know it's in the, in the centre. <coughs> Often these turning processes can be enormously frustrating when you're learning because um, it's nearly always a rule of thumb that if you try turning, try turning your pots, it will be the pots that you love which um, die and uh, through overturning, or and it will be the ones that you don't care so much, don't care so much for <laughs> when you're making are the ones that you turn well. Um, so often useful if you can see the inside of a form. To, uh, to have a good feel of it and a good look and kind of think where the thickness of clay might be. And that's when we use a separate set of tools, um, turning tools, sometimes hoop tools, or, or these are tools which uh, often that the students will make in the wood shop with Dallas. So already just that simple action of tidying up the pot. And then when the clay's in the right state to, to, to turn, it, it comes off in what we refer to as kind of almost ribbons of clay. If it's too dry, that's when it kind of comes off in, um, in like really tiny fragments, almost like chocolate chips. Chocolate chips are good, they're not good. Ribbons are good, chocolate chips are bad. And so what I'm doing here is using one of the, a square of a headed tool to put in a bit of definition. I'm going to pass that biscuit fired pot around. So important to point out at this stage as well that that pot there is made of the same clay as we're using here. So after a biscuit firing, after that first firing to a thousand degrees centigrade, this clay will be that white. Lovely. Almost goes like wax, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Sir? Mm.
to clearly define that footprint there. Um, but then I also want to take the clay out of the middle, so to do that, I'll... And you can see using this turning tool, and so much about using your hands, like for the throwing and the tools when we're working with the plastic clay, it's about balancing your hands as well, learning how to kind of really focus pressure. So even with an action like cutting into the clay here, I've got the support of my elbow on the clay. I've got my um, left hand over the clay to stop it moving too much. I've got my thumb of that support helping me to really almost like a lathe rest. Any of you have done any wood turning ever? It's almost supporting. Mm. And I'm going to cut. couple of concentric circles into that clay. So those handmade those tools, you can make your own? Yep, so these yeah. are made, I made these ones. Cool. And so that's, that's just three quarter inch mild steel. But those packs of tools I was showing you the other day often come with a hoop tool in like this. So sometimes some of our students prefer to use more uh, like a hoop tool. Right, to take off the... Yeah. It may come in different sizes and different shapes and different profiles as well. So, yeah, I've got a few of those. Not a big one like that. Mm. Well, that's good because it's got a long level thing on it, on the actual, so you can use it to level the work. Like you're doing there, yeah. She, lo um, like me, would love the turning processes. Some of her jars that she makes she used to spend eight hours just within the process of turning the clay. So each piece, uh, let alone the kind of making, preparing the clay and throwing it, she used to love the opportunity of precision that you can get through. Um, and, uh, through the turning processes, as would someone like um, Jeff Swindell. With those that like that tiny little teapot, other potters wouldn't would absolutely despise the processes of turning and these leather hard stages. And for them, it's all about the energy of the potter's wheel and throwing it as thinly as they can when they're making. And so it's, it, they have very different um, characteristics. And you'll see the same with uh, all users within this space. So it's not necessarily about kind of being able to turn or not being able to turn, but it's identifying what kind of the creative potentials are within any stage of processing. And when, uh, so Spencer had those extraordinary little porcelain bowls he was showing us, mm -hmm. um, and so Spencer dries his clay as he goes along, uses a hot air gun, uses a porcelain, uses exactly the same processes as this, but kind of keeps turning and turning into the clay. Well, and drying it as well with a gun. Yes, yeah, so when I'm turning my work, I usually maybe turn about six or eight pieces at a time. So turn them all a bit and then turn them all a bit more and turn them all a bit more to get the precision into the form. So I can take more. But was clay. he using the gun to actually dry them a bit quicker? Yeah, so right. that's how he To so get a bit harder, get yeah. more definition. Mm -hmm. I can turn more after that. Just to give you an insight into how that works relative to bigger work, so this isn't necessarily anything I'll be expecting of anyone today or tomorrow, <laughs> but just a, a kind of additional context to that. You might have noticed those tall pots on the shelf outside on the top. Has anyone seen those big white yeah. ones? So there's some of my pots I made last summer. Wow. Um, and obviously I don't stand them on their rim when I'm turning them. Uh, with those narrow necks, so that's when, um, when people are using turning processes. So like I put down that little yeah. chuck of clay to support the clay, but people also, you can also use what we call a chuck, a supporting chuck for the clay. Mm. And so this is uh, 
made then. Important too to realize that this is a, I, 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 had that, I was thinking last night to show you these techniques with this pot. This is a pot I made in August and it's still leather hard. You can keep things leather hard for a long time, but what you can't do is make them leather hard again once they've dried. You can't reverse mm. that process, which is why, like I was saying on Tuesday, it's useful to have plastic bags and be able to wrap things up or a bit of Tupperware as we're going along. So for example, the pieces you're making now, um, if you tidy them up a bit tomorrow, maybe turn them or maybe carve into them a bit by hand while it's leather hard. Um, you can be using, when we're looking at slips, maybe next, week next Thursday, so we can be using, looking at those processes. And so this is again perfect hardness for, for turning, and you can see what I mean about the ribbons of clay coming off. morning go to that, like the Greek lekathos. A lot of those pots, uh, those Greek pots are all sectionally thrown as well, so they're separate bases and necks and feet all thrown on and joined together when they're in the leather hard stage and turned together. I do a lot of sectional throwing with my own work, so I might start off with a piece like this but then um, throw a neck and make a neck a separate appendage on the top of it. You're telling us all your secrets. Mm -hmm. Why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be a fool to try. Don't be glad. Do the same. <laughs> yeah. like a drum and then drum skin, the thinner the clay gets, the, um, the more resonance you get, exactly. So when it's thick, when the clay's quite thick, it's quite dull and you can hear how it's kind of quite dense sound, mm. but when it's thinner you can get much more of a sense. You can actually make some quite nice drums really on this clay as well. Drums, yes. Mm. yes. Bit of acoustic resonance. It's really worth keeping an eye on your clay as you're working to, you know, too often people just kind of go, oh, I've made something and then walk away from it and then it dries out and they can't do the secondary stages or work on it as it changes. And just as important when you're working with slab building work and we're looking at constructing with slabs of clay, looking at constructing with um, uh, coils of clay as well. So often when we start off coiling the pots, we might start making them leave them to harden up a little bit, then we can work on them a bit more, and then you can come back to them uh, again. Uh, really fortunately, I think for us, um, something came up in one of the ceramics course committee meetings the other day about some of the second years wanting to do a bit more skill share in terms of material processes. So we were going to have an event next Wednesday um, around, that, uh, around your base space on that table looking at kind of a, a skill shares of students looking at different processes and how they're dealing with different processes. So a lot of the, especially the second and third years, sharing their skills and Natasha talking more about some of her making process skills. Um, and I was just chatting to Natasha about it over lunch 
and really um, happy for you to be up there as well on Wednesday through the day while we're working on that as well. But I thought it'd be a great way to kind of nuance some of your skill insights as well to see how a number of the um, this, uh, second and third years are talking about their development of skills. So that's particularly the hand for me. Scratch the surface and join the two together. Laying down a key. Yeah, but so when we join things together, always really important slab building, um, coiling, and uh, throwing. Scratching and slipping helps those two joints on the interface and the bigger the difference between the soft and the leather hard the more attention you need to bring to joining so we'll be looking at these processes both with me and with Matt over the next few weeks and also it's a reason why you'd want to make sure that this doesn't dry out too fast either Sorry, it can never be a good spectator sport. Well, we're all loving it. <laughs> Ideally, what I'd be using here is more like a little needle, like a pin. And sometimes what's a really useful tool to have is if you have a, an old toothbrush or buy yourself a cheap toothbrush or pack a, get a packing pound land. Really useful tool for ceramics for just scratching up surfaces to key them up together. Yeah, it made that look so easy. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest bit, isn't it? Bringing it up. And keeping it the right width. Very little. Quite, quite focused pressure. Quite control. And even there again, you can see arms oh, quite tight in the body just to really control what's. Sticks and I'm working sometimes more for rounded forms for throwing out shapes, but on these necks, just to help throw against and apply the good compression from the inside.
then with these I spent quite a lot of time again on the turning so I wouldn't throw them to the thinness of that neck. I'll leave them picture and then I'll turn them. Take them down. Hmm. Anyway, I spent an awful lot of time on this bit of the process and I won't bore you with all of that this afternoon. But that's essentially that's the, really the technique that I'd applied.